Good evening and welcome and thank you for joining with us for this our Tuesday night Bible teaching and prayer together. We're delighted over these uh, few Tuesday evenings to be having uh, Dr. Steve Lawson as part of the Ligonier teaching series. He's speaking on the attributes of God and this evening he's going to be addressing the theme of the omnipresence of God. But let us now join together in worship of God as we sing our opening praise, 10,000 reasons, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Father, it is the psalmist who penned those words, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, 
and forget not all his benefits. Father, as we come together to worship you, it is good that we do not forget your blessings to us. Lord, those blessings are innumerable. In the words of the little hymn, were we to count our many blessings and to name them one by one, then it would surely surprise us what the Lord has done. For indeed, every moment of our lives, every breath that we breathe is but a part of your blessing of us. And so we come to worship you this evening. We come to give you our praise, our thanks, our adoration. And we come, Lord, to acknowledge that we need you. We need to know your grace abounding in our lives. We need to know your strength for our weakness. We need to know your forgiveness for our sin. Lord, we are wholly dependent upon you. From the moment you conceived us in our mother's womb to the moment when you take us from this scene of time, it is in you alone that we live and move and have our being. And we pray that day and daily we might more and more acknowledge that each and every gift is from above, the giver who is good and gracious to us. And so we come to worship you. And Father, we come to thank you, not only for those many, many temporal blessings, but above all, that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. We thank you for our Saviour. Oh Lord, what a wonderful Saviour is Jesus, my Lord. He who would come from the glory of your presence, that glory he had enjoyed with yourself as Father and the Holy Spirit from all eternity past. And he should willingly come and restrict himself to a mere mortal's frame, that he should be numbered amongst us here upon this earth, that he should live here knowing the scorn and the mockery and perhaps what pained his soul most of all, the sin that was so evident in the lives of everyone about him, and he of pure and holy nature. We come to thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, he who came into our lives some point in the past, recently for some more distant for others, and he awakened us to our need of Christ. He opened our eyes to help us see our own sin in the light of your holiness. Lord, he showed us the awful judgment of our sin. And then he revealed to us Jesus Christ. He showed us the Lord in all his beauty. Showed us him who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He showed us how we could be forgiven. And that vast chasm that our sin introduced between you, a holy God, and us sinful people could be bridged and that only through our Lord Jesus and so we thank you for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and particularly this evening as he who is our teacher for as we turn to your word shortly we will need him to be enlightening our minds more and more in the things of Christ and so Lord bless us with your presence and receive of our worship and make this a good time together with you for we ask this in and through the name and for the sake of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let us turn to read together in the Word of God. And we're going to read in the Psalm 139. These are very well-known words uh, when the uh, psalmist is speaking about God's knowledge. 139 and reading from verse 7. The psalmist writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your right hand will hide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely, the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Well, we hand over to Dr. Steve Lawson for his teaching of us on the omnipresence 
of God. We come now in this session to the omnipresence of God. And I think we're beginning to understand why God is so incomprehensible. This is to say that God is above and beyond our limited capacity to comprehend Him. John Calvin, the great theologian, wrote, The finite, that would be you and me, cannot contain or grasp the infinite, that would be God. And the great Puritan Richard Sibb said, How shall finite comprehend the infinite? We shall apprehend Him, but not comprehend Him. Now, this is not to say that we cannot know God. We can know God, and we do know God. That's what it is to have a saving relationship through Jesus Christ with God. It is to know God. And we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to grow ever deeper and ever closer to God. But we can never comprehend the fullness of all that God is. And this leads us now into these next attributes that begin with the Latin word omni, which means all. Uh, Omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence. Uh, These words mean that God is all-knowing, that God is all-present, and that God is all-powerful. Right there, that expands our minds to the outer limits, and we cannot grasp the, the whole of what that means, but we do want to look into the Scripture and see what our God is like. Who is this God that we have come to know? And He is omnipresent. And so as we look at this attribute of God, His omnipresence, and there are four things that I want to tell you about the omnipresence of God. And number one, He is everywhere present. Now, the Bible clearly asserts by this name of this attribute, omnipresence, that God is all-present. This is to say He is everywhere present. He is in every place, at every point of His creation. There is no place within the universe from which God is excluded or barred. As we've already talked about in a previous session, God is a spirit being, so therefore He does not have spatial dimensions. He has no limitations Uh, He can be everywhere present at one time. And let me go one step further. He can be everywhere present in the fullness of all that He is at any one time. I don't know that I'm always there when I'm there. Uh, Sometimes my mind can be someplace else and my body be right here. And uh, I'm a divided soul. But God is always ever present with the fullness of all that He is. I think the signature text for this is Psalm 139, uh, verses 7 and following. You'll recognize them immediately as I begin to read this. Where can I go from your spirit? It's a rhetorical question. Implies a negative answer, nowhere. Uh, There's nowhere that we can go and... Uh, escape from God's Spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Again, the question is asked, and the answer is nowhere. Now, listen to the answer, the, the, the explanation in verses 8 and 9. It has a north, south, east, west uh, compass uh, metaphor without using these designations. If I ascend to heaven you are there. Now, heaven is due north. It's up. It's straight up. So, if I ascend to heaven, to the north, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's the grave, that's down, behold, you are there. That would be south. If I take the wings of the dawn, now that the sun rises in the east, the wings of the dawn, 
if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea. Well, the Mediterranean Sea in the Holy Land is to the west. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. No matter where I go, the heights of heaven, to the depths of the grave, as far to the east as I can go where the sun is rising, to the west where the sea is formed, you're already there. In fact, you are so close to me, your hand is on me. All this is saying there is no escaping God's presence. No matter where we go, whether it's life or death, time or eternity, land or sea, God, you are there. Now, second, let's be more specific, the heights of heaven. We know God is in the heights of heaven. We know that God dwells on a high and holy throne. But let's look at some verses and just document this. This is called the transcendence of God, that God is high in the heavens. Uh, Psalm 123, verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes. O you who are enthroned in the heavens. There we have it. He is seated in the heavens. And by the way, you know what the word heaven means? Heights. And when heavens is in the plural, it's really the heights of the heights that God is as high as any being in the universe. No one is above God. In the organizational chart of the universe, God is by Himself at the head. Psalm 97, verse 9, For you are the Lord, most high over all the earth, towering over the earth. No one on His level, God over all. We just read Isaiah 6, verse 1. I saw the Lord seated on His throne, lofty and exalted. That's where God is. God is ever and always on His throne in heaven. In fact, when John, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, verse 1, as he was on the island of Patmos, he heard a voice saying, Come up here. And a door was opened in heaven. And John was caught up in his spirit from the island of Patmos as though to enter into heaven. And what does he see? What's the first thing he saw? Not streets of gold, not gates of pearl, not a river of life, not who's there, who's not there. First thing he saw, a throne standing in heaven and everything in the universe finding itself in relationship to this throne. A throne standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. It's very clear the message in the first century to the early church as they were beginning to be beaten down by the Roman Empire Don't you worry, there is one seated on his throne. And he is the Caesar of Caesars. And he is the King of Kings and the Judge of Judges and the the Lord of Lords. That was the message. And that is the message for us in this hour. That God is in his heavens. And God is upon his throne. God is high and lifted up. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says succinctly, God is in heaven. Isaiah 57.15, I dwell on a high and holy place. Even when we read the account of the Tower of Babel, do you recall that? They were trying to build a, a, a ziggurat up to the heights of heaven. What a laughable thing. And it says in Genesis 11 verse 5, that the Lord came down to see. (laughs) I mean, this little sand pile down here, 
I mean, that's so small and I'm so high, I'm going to have to come down to even kind of squint to look at it. That's how high and mighty and lifted up is the Lord. He's in the heights of heaven. And how this fact, as we look up to Him, it just lifts our spirit and it lifts our hearts. Uh, If we have only a horizontal gaze, we will be discouraged. But if we have this vertical gaze to the heights of heaven, our heart soars above the circumstances. But there's something else that I want you to note, and that is... Not only is He in the heights of heaven, but third, He is near on the earth. Not only is He transcendent, but He is imminent. Not only is He far away, but He is near. Now let me tell you, that's the best of both worlds. You you can't have a better God than this. A God who is high and ruling and reigning, but a God who is also in the trenches with me, a God who is in the pit with me, a God who is walking with me through the valley of the shadow of death, a God who is with me in the nitty-gritty of life, a God who is with me in the tough times, a God who is with Daniel in the lion's den, a God who is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the fiery furnace with them? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What a comfort it is to know that we're never alone, that God plus one still makes a majority that God is with us, and God is in us, and God is for us, and God goes before us, and God is under us, and He is over us, and He comes in behind us to guard us and to protect us. Our God is with us. What a glorious truth there is, that this is. Deuteronomy 4 verse 39 says, He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Isaiah 57, 15. I love this verse. Listen to this text. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. Now he will tell us that God lives in two places. He has two addresses. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. God is in the highest place in the universe, and He is in the lowest place on the earth with those who are bowed down and even beaten down under the heavy blows of life and who have a low and contrite spirit, God says, I am with that one who is lowly and contrite in heart. He promised the church in the Great Commission, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. He says to us in Hebrews 13 verse 5, I will never desert you nor will I ever forsake you. God is with us in every adversity. He is with us in every trial. He is with us in every storm of life. In fact, I think we could even go so far as to say He is never any closer to us than when we need Him the most. Jeremiah 23, verse 23 Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? Right there God says, I am a God who is the God who is far off, and I'm a God who is near. He is everywhere. The heights of heaven and with the most humble and lowly of heart. 
Ephesians 4 verse 6 says, One God and Father of all who is over all, that's His transcendence, and through all, that is His eminence, and in all. Think about those prepositional phrases. Over all, through all, in all. That is God's omnipresence. He's in the heights of heaven. He is everywhere on the earth. He is near to us. He is close to us. He is also in the depths of hell. There is no place where God does not exist. And it is even God Himself who is inflicting His own wrath in hell. It is God Himself who is carrying out His own vengeance upon the unbeliever in hell. Revelation 14 verse 10 is really the key text on this mind-expanding truth. He, referring to the one who is an unbeliever, will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of His anger. What a metaphor that is. And He will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Now listen to this. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This wrath, this vengeance will be executed in the very direct presence of the Lamb. And I believe it is reasonable to make the implication that it is the Lamb Himself who will be the executor of His own wrath in hell. Sometimes we say the expression, if you don't believe in Christ, if you don't commit your life to Christ, you will go to hell away from the Lord. Those in hell only wish that they were away from the Lord. They only wish they were left alone. They only wish they could escape from the wrath of the Lamb. They only wish that they were no longer in His presence. Now, this needs to be reconciled with 2 Thessalonians 1.9, which says, These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Well, this word for presence here is a Greek word that means away from the eye of the Lord, away from the countenance of the Lord. And the idea is the Lord will turn His face away, no longer to extend any grace, even common grace, but that the Lord will turn away any any smile of His countenance as they will be forever under the execution of His wrath. So the Lord is in the heights of heaven. The Lord is everywhere on the earth. Uh, the, in fact, even when we read the uh, account of the ark and when God says, to enter the ark, God says, come in, as though God is inside the ark. Come in. God is in the depths of hell. God is everywhere present. Let me tell you two things about this truth. It's comforting and it's convicting. It's a two-edged sword. It plays both sides of the aisle. And I know you're out ahead of me as you're thinking this through. First of all, it's comforting, is it not? 
to know that God is with me in every adversity of life, every difficulty of life. I'm never on my own. His grace is always sufficient and with me. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, God is in the trenches of life with me to help me, to comfort me, to encourage me. But this also means that I can never escape the Lord as well. And there are people who, like Jonah, try to run away from God, try to run to another city, try to run to another state, try to run to another wife or to another family, and they think they can escape the Lord. What fools they are. You can never escape the Lord. He is everywhere present. Now, this is a very convicting truth that God is everywhere present. And so, therefore, we cannot run away from our troubles. We cannot run away from our problems as though we can avoid God in having to deal with situations. No, God is everywhere present. So, this truth of the omnipresence of God Only God is omnipresent. Let us be encouraged that the devil is not omnipresent. The devil roams about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. There's only one devil, and he can only be in one place at one time. Um, It's his minions that we most wrestle with. It is his underlings. It is his demon spirits that we most really combat. Um... It would be like a man going to Europe to fight World War II and saying he fought Hitler. Well, you probably didn't fight Hitler. You probably fought German soldiers. And so it is in spiritual warfare with us. Let us rejoice that only God is omnipresent, not the devil. Well, as we bring this session to a close, um, I trust that we will give much thought to this, at this truth, and that our minds will yet be enlarged again, this incomprehensible God. Yet we can clearly understand these truths, can we not? That God is ever and always present with us, and we can never escape Him.
Well, we turn together now to time of prayer and, of course, we find great comfort in what the Word of God has been teaching us, that the Lord is always with us. There's no time in our life's experience when He is apart from us and it's a great comfort to the believer to know that. I trust you've been able to access the PCI uh, Let's Pray prayer points and also our own uh, local congregational prayer points. And as has been our practice on Tuesday evenings, I will lead us in prayer, touching on a number of these various points. And then following our closing praise and benediction, I want to just encourage you to take some minutes uh, just to be praying, perhaps for some of the matters that are mentioned, perhaps for some individual or circumstance that the Lord has placed upon your own heart. Well, let us come together in prayer, and as has been my practice in these weeks, I'm going to use uh, the written prayer in the Let's Prayer Bulletin uh, with which to commence our prayer time together. Let us pray. All Sovereign God, we come before you humbled by the experience of coronavirus and lockdown. Our world has been stopped in its tracks. So much of what we take for granted suddenly became uncertain. So many of the plans we have made not prevailed. Our lives really feel like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We confess we do not like the sense of not being in command. and We are reluctant to release control even to you. We see so many ways in which we have been proud boastful and foolish. Forgive us for our lack of faith that has been revealed, for the restlessness in our hearts that has been uncovered, for the many ways in which we stubbornly rebel against you. Teach us what it means to seek first your kingdom, for your kingdom to come and your will to be done, to patiently allow your kingdom to grow like a tiny seed to a great tree, for too often our thoughts are not your thoughts. Our ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so your ways will tower above our puny imaginings. For you reign, rule and overrule, for your glory and our good, and that your grace might be known to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our gracious and loving God, as we come from your word to us, we do thank you for the light of that word that shines so brightly throughout your world, so that even today that word has brought light into many darkened souls. We rejoice, O Lord, that the entrance of your word brings light. We rejoice that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And we thank you that, Lord, that word and that gospel have delivered men and women and boys and girls from their bondage to sin, broken the chains that have held them and brought them into the great freedom that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are mindful, O Lord, that there are yet many people who do not have access to this word and do not have opportunity to hear this gospel. Oh, how blessed we are in our own province. How blessed our neighbours and our community who have access to the scriptures in their own language, who have access to a place of worship and the preached gospel week by week and many times in the course of a week. And yet, sadly, Lord, how often those things have been neglected those things have been set aside. Those things have been ignored as being irrelevant. And yet, Father, there is nothing more important in this life than knowing you. There is nothing more important than living this life for you and preparing for the end of life that by your own grace shown us in Jesus Christ, we might be with you. And so we pray that you would bless your word as it goes forth in many places. Lord, we continue to pray uh, for the release of lockdown. Families are so thankful now that they can visit uh, their loved ones in hospital, in care homes, and yet there are still many precautions 
that need to be taken. And we continue to pray for wisdom for us all. Lord, for no matter what the government says or doesn't say, we need to take responsibility for our own behaviour and how we react and interact with others. So we pray for much grace in these days. We're conscious, O oh Lord, that there are still outbreaks of this terrible virus and, and secondary outbreaks in some of these countries that perhaps felt they, they were past the worst of it. And it's a solemn warning to us all, O oh Lord, of the reality of this virus. But Father, it is surely an even more solemn reminder to us of our own frailty, of the uncertainty of our own lives in this world. And hence, Lord, we're praying that in the midst of all of the problems and difficulties and anxieties of these days, there will be many, many people who are seeing the uncertainty as we were reminded in, in that opening part of our prayer, our lives are like a mist which is here but for a time and then vanishes. But Lord, we don't end. No, we move from this scene of time into that eternal realm. And Lord, we pray that people will see that eternity is a long, long time to be under God's wrath and may they seek your mercy at this time. And so Lord, we cry out to you to have mercy upon us. We do remember our children, our young people, for whom uh, the summertime is the break away from school. And yet in some ways, uh, Lord, that's a very strange thing because they've been off school for so long. But to do pray that they will be refreshed uh, through these weeks. And we do especially pray, Lord, for the upcoming children's clubs that are being held. Some are being held on church premises with all the precautions in place. Others, like our own, are being held online. And so we pray for the contact that we will make with the many children who would normally be attending our church halls uh, in the summertime and pray that they will have some way to find access uh, to the programme online and that, Father, even through that, you would be speaking into their lives. And Lord, perchance not just their lives, but there may be parents who will be sitting with them and uh, sharing with them. And we thank you, Lord, that a little child can lead even mums and dads and grannies and grandas to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray for Bill and Linda. We pray for the whole team who have been involved in putting that all together and that, Lord, you will richly bless them as they see the fruit of their labour. And especially, we pray, in the lives of boys and girls being wonderfully changed by your goodness and by your grace. Father, we look to you on behalf of our own congregation. Lord, there are many of our number who are led aside at present. There have been a number who have had falls and broken bones. And Lord, we realise that uh, with the added years that healing isn't just as quick. And so we're praying you will give them patience. We're praying that you would uh, grant them ease from the pain and that, that their suffering, that you would speak your peace into their hearts as they're cared for uh, by medical staff. Father, we look to you conscious that of our own frailty and asking that you would minister your love and grace into their lives. We're conscious too, Lord, of those who continue to struggle with all the problems of being in lockdown, of being still isolated, of still shielding because of their own underlying medical conditions we pray loving father that you would speak your peace into their hearts and that lord you would be with them through these days as they seek to cope with their own particular situation and perhaps more so as they see others now being out and about and wishing that they could be out with them as well lord we do pray for the ongoing ministry online that the lord will be using it uh, to both encourage believers in their faith as we delve into the truth of your word, as we learn from the scriptures, but also, Lord, that it may be a means of bringing others to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray that even in these days you will be doing things that we might never have imagined possible. You'll be touching lives that otherwise might have remained untouched. And so we look to you, Father, to bless your word to that end. Loving God, we cast ourselves upon you. For as a church, we're being cautious as we seek to move forward. As we seek to contemplate 
developing uh, our church life a little. And we're just so thankful, Father, that we have a session who are being wise and thoughtful in relation to all our members and seeking in every way to lead us forward in your will and to your glory. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless us even as we have shared together, perhaps as families, as couples, perhaps even on our own, just in our homes, that, Lord, we will know your presence. We will sense not only your loving arms about us, but, Father, we will sense the prayers. We will sense the presence of those who, on a Tuesday night, we would normally love to see face to face. We would normally love to share in the fellowship of prayer. But, Father, as there as their faces come before our minds even this evening we are praying for them those who would normally sit with us talk to us those who would sit beside us uh, behind us and we think of them and we commend them to your love and to your grace and we do so look forward to once again being together and to uniting hearts and minds and voices together in prayer at the throne of grace and so father in the meanwhile keep us close to yourself lord bless us as we seek to follow you day by day and enable us in all our ways to bring honour, praise and glory to you, our great God, and to our wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let us join together to sing in closing a, a hymn which is also a prayer, Nearer My God to Thee. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.